don't you click that remote, don't you turn, don't you change anything, because if you do, you're going to miss a really, 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 really good show. This our guest this evening is State Rep, State Rep Christian Mitchell. He is, of course, a Democrat from Chicago, a Democrat from Bronzeville. And more importantly, more importantly, you're going to find out what's going on with pensions. Is there a chance that this state could actually figure it out and get that right? Is there a chance that we could improve education, especially in low-income areas where kids, you know, in some areas, 20% of the kids, black kids, are reading at grade level. Hispanics aren't doing much better. And as long as they're with low-income parents, those numbers are reasonably accurate. Oh, and you're going to find out about violence and if there's anything to be done. Oh, don't you, if you, if you, if you click that remote, you're going to miss a really, 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 really good show with State Rep. Christian Mitchell. Watching Public Affairs. Berkowitz is my name, and politics is our game. And we are going to be doing lots of politics and public policy this evening because we have as our guest State Rep. Christian Mitchell. As I promised, uh, look, if you want to know about State Rep. Christian Mitchell, you want to know he's currently living in Bronzeville, right? Indeed, I am. He's 27 years old, I right? Am. Uh, you plead guilty to having gone to the University of Chicago College as an undergrad? Guilty as charged. All right, we'll come to the sentencing later for that. Look we'll more about Christian as we get into the show. I should say Representative Mitchell, but but look, people want to know, and I think it's a fair question. There's all this killing going on every weekend. I think this last weekend they said was a good weekend because there were only 40 shootings in yeah. the Chicago area and only five people killed. A weekend or two ago it was 80 shootings and 10 or 12 people killed. Five of them, I think, by cops, or maybe that was some other group. Is this any way to run a railroad? Well, look, I, this is, first of all, thanks for having me on the show, Jeff. Really appreciate it. I know you've had some great guests, including uh, one of my predecessors who later went on to do some other things in politics. What was that guy's name? I, I can't I, think of it. He, he was known before, but you know how Obama. they forget He, he had Obama? this dreams about my it? father thing. Uh, yeah, right. So I, my district, is, of course, is one half of President Obama's old district. His old what? Senate district old Senate has districts. two House districts. That's correct. Has two House districts. You, you, you are in one of those House districts. That's correct. All right. I'm That's just curious, correct. who was the other rep at that time? The other rep, uh, I believe, was still uh, Barbara Flynn Curry. Uh, she's who still, still there. My, who is still my seatmate, indeed. It's a pretty classy area. I mean, Obama, Curry, it's a Harold very high-rent neighborhood. Neon it's, Dupre, it's, it's a high-rent neighborhood that you're in. You know, it, uh, they, they have great expectations of their representatives down there. Um, but as I said, thanks for having me on the show. The violence issue is personal for me. Now, I'm originally from Maywood. I came south to go to the University of Chicago, fell in love with it, uh, and that's where I'm going to be making my life. It's where I represent. But I grew up in Maywood, uh, you know, around gangs, dealing with gang violence, drugs and, and, and gun violence. Currently in Bronzeville, I hear the gunshots at night, so I understand how, how deeply impactful this is for our city. Uh, we've got a couple problems. I mean, the biggest one, of course, is that you've got a lack of, of hopefulness, a lack of belief uh, in, in a lot of, of these communities. There aren't a lot of jobs. There is a lot of violence. And for some people, um, it's just become a norm. Um, that's not acceptable. So I think there's a couple things that we can do. One, we have to continue to, to bring jobs back to our community. Two, and I know we'll talk about this later because I know how, how big education is for you, we have to improve our public schools because if kids are going to school, understanding how that's going to connect directly to a job in, a, in a, uh, a, a growth opportunity, they will be willing and able to put in the hours to go to school. Their parents will support them. We've got to do that. But we also have to get some of these guns off the streets. Now, I know there's um, kind of mixed opinions on uh, you know, universal background checks, all those sorts of things. But even beyond that, I'm chairing a task force on illegal gun trafficking that's going to start uh, meeting in August. And one of the things we're going to do is work on making sure these truckloads of guns, these carloads of guns, these cargo trains full of guns that are coming across from Indiana, coming in from Mississippi, coming in from the suburbs, that we start to interdict them before they actually get to the hands of gangs. Not legal guns, but illegal guns that are going from straw buyers to the streets. If we can cut off that flow of guns, and it will give us time to start to recover our streets by creating more jobs, by improving our education system, by decreasing the collateral damage. You don't hear about, if you and I had Let a fight. Let me just say, uh, I don't want to get too long sure, on this, sure. I want to get some back and forth here. Of course. Let's recap and make sure. 
So the third reason was cut off the flow of guns into Illinois? Absolutely. <clears throat> or the third, no, I shouldn't say the third reason. The third way you're going to get at violence, cut off the flow of illegal guns into Illinois, into, into Chicago? Into, into, into hot spots, into gang. Chicago, how, okay. how do we stop okay. guns from getting into the hands of gangs? Okay. But you keep saying, you change the stop guns or stop illegal guns? Stop guns, what do you mean? Stop illegal guns, okay. Let's be, to be very, very clear. We just passed concealed okay. carry in the state of Illinois, so, so we okay. have more firearms, but the illegal ones are the ones we're concerned about. And what do you about. mean by illegal guns? So it, what happens is somebody goes out to a gun shop either in the, the south suburbs or in Indiana, wherever it is, they buy a trunk full of guns, they come back and they sell them. Uh, to some of these folks who shouldn't have them. So they're called straw purchasers. It's the thing the ATF is worried about right now nationwide. These aren't legal gun owners. They are potentially legal folks who are buying the gun in the first place, but they're selling them to people who shouldn't have them. Uh, and, and we've got to be able sure. to do it because they're not, as you know, or do you know, it's the case in Illinois if you sell guns and you're a gun shop, do you have to do a background check? You are supposed to. And now we passed a, okay. a law along with concealed carry that says if I'm a legal gun owner, you're a legal gun owner, and I want to sell you one of my guns. If I uh, want to do that, I've got to call the state police and say, hey, I just want to verify that Jeff has a FOID card. They do a, a quick okay. check, and <clears throat> if it's indeed you have, a, you have a card, it checks out, I can sell you that gun. If not, we can finally prosecute you in a meaningful and, way. That and, will help. And if it's a gun shop, they have to do the same thing? Yes. And that, and that was the to. case before. Yes, indeed it was. <clears throat> and they run a background check as well, or is it just what finding out if you have a FOID so, card? So what often happens is the person who goes into the gun shop and buys all the guns indeed has a valid card and is a legal gun owner and mm. probably has a relatively clean criminal background. Mm. But they are then taking those guns and they are selling them on the illegal market. And so what we have to figure and out is the by way... By selling them in the illegal market, they're not authorized to be a seller. That's so correct. they don't do a background check. They don't check for a FOID card. More they importantly, know. the person buying isn't authorized to be a buyer. And, and, and this person either doesn't care or doesn't check or whatever. That's okay. right. And what you're doing to stop that right now, to stop the... The person who's selling it illegally, mm -hmm. probably knowing that the buyer might have trouble buying it legally. What are you doing to stop that? So we've got to do a couple of things. So part of this is we've got, like, we have to make sure that we work with our downstate assistant state's attorneys to actually prosecute gun running straw, uh, straw purchasing cases. We have to make sure they have the training and ability to do so. We have to make sure that the Illinois State Police and the Chicago Police Department are sharing information. I know this all sounds kind of like basic stuff, but it's stuff that we need to do to make sure that it's actually so you, working. Okay, so we, all of these things are not a matter of changing the law or at least a number, most of these things now are a matter of enforcing it better. Is I that think what you're so. I me? think so. I think that there might be some cases, for example, um, there are some states where if you're a convicted gun trafficker, we have the ability to seize your vehicle so that you can't okay. continue to do what you were doing. I don't know that that law is on the books, so that might need to change, but for the most part, Jeff, I do think it's enforcement. And does the U.S. attorney need to be doing more? Because, you know, Bill yep. Brady, when he was running for governor, and it's funny because we heard this from Brady. Pat Quinn, where are you? We'd like you on the show to answer this. Because I never heard Pat Quinn talk about it. I just heard Bill Brady. So I kind of wonder who was right. Brady said the U.S. attorney was not doing enough, was spending too much time, or I guess he was saying implicitly, on public corruption, not enough time on going after people who were doing harm with guns. Brady wasn't saying public corruption isn't important. Mm -hmm. And I think he referred to Virginia as an area where they were doing more in enforcement the U.S. Attorney's Office, and they were getting results. Do you have any thoughts on that difference between Brady and Quinn? Well, I think I mean, that, I know you're a Democrat, so... Sure. You know. Well, I, I... Quinn's a Democrat, I think, right? Absolutely. Yeah. So, look, I mean, the politics piece of this isn't something I'm okay. going to get into. What I will say is that I'm not familiar with Senator Brady's remarks. If indeed he said that, I would agree. I think okay. that we've got a new... Uh, United States Attorney and Zach Fardon, who has said explicitly at the City Club and other places okay. that this is something he wants to focus on, I think there's a great role for him. And in well, fact, our resolution that created this task force names him directly along with our state's attorney and our police departments and all those things. Okay. And what's the penalty for a straw seller? We always call them straw purchases, but the person who is facilitating, who is selling guns, probably knowing, whether knowing or not, selling it to somebody who uh, he's not checking to see whether sure. that person, and he's violating the law by doing that, or he's not authorized. What is he doing illegally that, that what I'll call him a straw seller? What is that person doing illegally? Yeah, so I, is he doing something illegal? By, by absolutely he is. What's um, he now doing we, illegal? We just, 
he's selling to an unauthorized buyer. How that does is, he know he's unauthorized unless he's, I mean, he's checked. So if, so right now, the law, and I believe, I want to say it was, a, uh, I can't remember the bill number, but it was Representative Zaleski was the chief sponsor of my seatmate. I was okay. chief co-sponsor. We passed this right after concealed carry, and it put in place that FOID background check system okay. for private handgun sales that we okay, talked about. Okay, that's, and so, so if he doesn't check to see if the person has a FOID card, then he's essentially selling it to an unauthorized. That's correct. Because he didn't take the time to find out right. if he was authorized. And if we see a pattern, now, now if we see a pattern of that, what we can do, and I forget what the exact enhancement was, but we enhanced a couple of years ago before I was a state rep, the penalty for being a convicted straw buyer. If, it's, not, if, it's, if there's a pattern. That's and correct. if there's not a pattern, what's the penalty? Um, it is a, I forget the class of felony. Is it, it's a know. felony. Indeed it well, is. How much, is there any mandatory time in jail? I, I don't know that it's mandatory, but there's a recommended sentence. But see, I think if somebody's watching this, mm -hmm. with all due respect, sure. aren't they going to say, you should know? Because people Maybe. are saying that the penalties are, well, you hear this. Mm -hmm. the, the 2A people, the Second Amendment folks, okay, mm -hmm. the so-called right-wingers, they say, don't take away my guns, take them away from the bad guys. Sure. And if you got a bad guy committing a crime like this, mm -hmm. make the penalty high. So I'm asking you, and you say you don't know. No, I mean, you really look, you should know. So, should, I know you're not a lawyer. Sure. But say say there's no say there's no minimum penalty. Say the minimum penalty is two months. Should you guys be jumping all look, up I, and down? I, this is there's always a jump here. I think on the other side of this to make sure that there's mandatory sentencing that we're taking away discretion from judges doing all those things. I don't tend to ascribe to that theory. There's been a conversation. So for you're a while okay about, with mandatory minimum sentences? I, I don't. I don't like mandatory minimum oh, sentences. Oh, so you you're saying you you subscribe to the theory we shouldn't have mandatory? I sentences. think that we need to. Have we shouldn't take discretion. In so far as we can, we need judicial discretion. Now but that's I, what we have now, not, don't we? There we is discretion. A, I think that there isn't a hard and fast rule on this. I'm not somebody okay. who tends to. Uh, okay. I kind of ascribe to that sort of theory. What I do think is we have to make sure we do the right combination of enforcement for folks who need, for example, look, if you are a, a gang member using a weapon to commit a crime, we ought to throw the book at you. We, we ought to do that. So we need but to find out first what's the book now and is the book too light and should you guys and girls down in Springfield well, I don't you, think you it's, guys and, guy, and girls are the ones who at least set the, the range question, for the Jeff, judges. The question, sentence. Jeff, is are we throwing the book at all? That's the question. And I think in are part, we are we throwing the book at all? Because what we see, what my, my curiosity and one of the things that this committee is going to seek to figure out is how well are we, how many gun running cases are we prosecuting? How many straw buyers are we purchase, are we are we actually prosecuting right. every single year? I don't have clarity on that. So in part, what this committee is going to be seeking is what are the penalties now? Are they high enough or low enough? And by the way, how are we enforcing them? Or are we spending all of and our when time? Am, when am I going to be able to read the results of that? So we're supposed to have a report due by November. November one. Uh, I want to say November one. So, so actually, I, right before the election. Indeed. Do you think that's just uh, coincidental? Well, I do, considering I kind of drafted the resolution. I think it really is about how do we okay. make sure that okay. we have some accountability going into okay. veto session for things that okay. we can do. So we've covered guns and violence mm -hmm. a bit. The second factor that you're going to focus on, you said, was improving the quality of education, right? Sure. And the first factor was? Jobs. So for, jobs. Okay. So if we get people more jobs, and especially people in low-income areas, and especially probably younger people, because that's the demographic that commits the most crimes, right? Mm-hmm. And if well, we and get, their parents. They need to be able to see their parents going to work so they right. develop the, you know, a culture of okay. work and expectation to be there. And if we get improve the quality of education for young kids... So in fourth grade, if they're not learning how to read, well, they will be learning how to read, mm -hmm. so then they don't drop out and join a gang, right? That's helpful, absolutely. Okay. And then we just take care of this gun stuff that you're talking about and find out the results. And if on November 1 the results look bad, you guys are, and ladies are going to pass a law stiffening enforcement. I think we're going to work on it, absolutely. Not going to work on it. People don't want to hear Absolutely. Okay, it's I'm going to just say this one time. I said it like 10 times in a recent show on school choice. Mm -hmm with a young guy named Trey Cobb. You know Trey Cobb? I've met Trey. You know Trey, okay, mm -hmm. because he's, he's, he's 17 years old, right? Mm -hmm. He's at DePaul. He graduated from high school when he was 15. Now, tell me, what, what's, what's remarkable about Trey Cobb? It is always, to me, um, given the odds that a lot of young men face, especially a lot of young black men, um, to see somebody who says, um, look, Trey's got all the opportunity in the world. He can go anywhere he wants to go, and he is choosing to say, look, I want to stand on my own two feet and fight for my community. And we don't agree on everything. But Trey and I have a, a well, had Tell a, me a Trey's long... argument. Tell, tell the, the viewers what Trey's argument is and why you disagree, and we'll, well, look, we'll go I, from there. I, I, so the entirety of his argument, I'm not going to no, entirely... just give it to him in 30 seconds. 
what I'm saying is the thing where I, I think we're going here is probably on school choice, which is just another name for vouchers. No, but for you vouchers. tell people a little bit more about Trey. I think it's important. We'll get to vouchers. But sure. So for once in my life, I'm not going to say rush to vouchers, okay? Are you sure? I want to hear more about Trey. Uh, no, I look, I, I think what's remarkable about Trey is that he's saying, look, um, I've gotten where I've gotten based on the educational opportunities that I've received. Right, and what were those educational opportunities? I, I don't remember exactly where he went to school, if that's what you're yeah, asking. he never went to a public school. Okay. He went to private schools, mm -hmm. and you know how he was able to do it? Because you may know, he's, not, he's from a good family and parents who love him and care and so forth and have given him good values, mm -hmm. but they're not by any means well-to-do. Sure, either And not. he would say they couldn't have sent, he couldn't have gone to the private school if it was simply a matter of his parents' income. Barack Obama sent his kids to the lab school mm -hmm. where you went at, to college at the University of Chicago. Sure. He's, you know what? His kids could do it because Barack, even before he was president, I'm betting he and Michelle were making over, yes, folks, over 200000 a year. I don't say that well, bad. Well, paying student loans, but sure. Yeah, it's that. not terrible. I'm not somebody, you know, the Democrats. Many Democrats say it's terrible if you make too much money. I think it's Who good that they were making. Democrats? Well, there are a few. Okay. okay. But anyway. The point is, Trey's parents couldn't have done it, so he went to he got scholarships that sent him to private schools sure. that were much better than the traditional neighborhood schools that would have been his alternative. First in California, then here in Illinois, mm -hmm. in Chicago. Does that tell you anything? Is Trey a model for? Were you thinking? Well, maybe we should have lots of people who don't have to depend on private scholarships to have the kind of choice he had to I opt think out should, of a b failing public school and go to a private school. I think we you're have big, to, You're a big believer in school choice? I think we have to invest in our public school. So look, I, I just went through a very difficult uh, election based on my uh, willingness to say that insofar as charter schools, for example, can be laboratories of innovation, we ought to be promoting of them. Now, not at the expense of traditional neighborhood schools, but insofar as they're taking best practices, ways to integrate arts education, civics education, and bring those back to disseminate throughout our public schools, we ought to be promoting of these. Because we've got some in my district that where 75% of their kids are reading or at, at state level are exceeding state standards. We don't need to throw that out with the bathwater. At the same time, I consider vouchers to be a step too far. And the reason why I say that is because we have to address our school system as a whole. This can't be about the few escapees who get out. Um, this isn't all about exceptionalism. It's about making sure that anybody can walk to a quality neighborhood school in their neighborhood. Now, we've got, you talk about things that we need to do Excuse rather me, than just, just say. You, why can't everybody leave? If we give them a full voucher, you know we spend there aren't, 50... First of all, there aren't enough slots, number okay. one. Number two, Jeff, what I okay. want to say okay. is that... There aren't enough slots? What's there aren't enough mean? slots in private schools what? for everybody who would want, who could potentially might want to go if we gave them this yeah, system. Do you know how many slots there currently I don't are? know the... I do not know the current number of would slots. I know it's insufficient. Would if I said there would be ten or 15,000 slots? Still not sufficient with I know, the school system have you for 400,000. Did you study economics at the University of Chicago? I sure did. Did you ever hear of Say's Law? JB Say? heard of it, but it's been a while. Well, it's only, I'll refresh your recollection. Supply creates its own demand. I'd say Say got it wrong. Here's mm -hmm. Jeff's law. Demand creates its own supply. If you give parents of low-income kids, or par if you give low-income parents of kids who are currently in the Chicago public schools, the amount we're currently spending, it's 15000 per kid per year on average. It's actually closer to thirteen. Well, but we can argue about that. Sure. But okay, I'll take your number. I think it's a little low. Let's say it's thirteen thousand. If we give every parent in CPS thirteen thousand, and say you can now use that thirteen thousand to either stay at your public, your traditional neighborhood school, mm -hmm. and remember, charter schools are public schools as well. They are. You can stay at that school if you like, and nothing changes. Or you can take that thirteen thousand and give it to a charter school. If you can get in, they do it by lottery. And if they don't want to go to a charter school and there's a private school available, you can give it to the private school. And what I'm telling you, and I think I know this, and I wonder if you disagree, mm -hmm. if you give that much purchasing power to every family, and I was correct when I said there are 10 or 15,000 slots, I don't mm -hmm. know if I was, I can assure you within a year there'll be 100,000 slots if there are that many people who want to transfer that money. Mm -hmm. That's what I mean about demand creates its own supply. Let me, sure. you'll get your turn. Sure, sure. I'll keep it quick. You know, these things, when people want to buy smartphones, nobody, ha we don't need a Russian czar, you know, to have a five-year plan. Mm -hmm. The private market goes out and makes these. Mm -hmm. When people want to buy cars that cost 20000 to 40000 there are people who will make them. Mm -hmm. And if the demand for those cars goes up, as this would for schools, they're there that year. 
okay? All sorts of people who are doing activity A go into activity B. Sure. Have you heard anything that I've said so far that you disagree with? Um, yes. Tell me. So, so, so let's start from this up. So first okay. of all, um, I'm not willing to give up on our public school system. Let's, let's just start there. So in part, what happens with vouchers is that they drain resources from the broader public school system. And it's not as simple to say, you can't compare a school system to a phone. The market forces are not the same. That's not how it works. The scale is not the same. The impact that a school has as a community institution, the multiplier effect that a school has as a community institution is not the same, number one. Number two, you've got a, You've got all sorts of large-scale transportation problems, but the bigger thing you've got here, Jeff, because we talked about action versus words. Let's talk about a place where the General Assembly has taken significant action that needs to be augmented. Senator Andy Menard from downstate passed a bill out of the Senate last year, this year, I'm sorry, Senate Bill 16, the Education Funding Reform Act of 2014. And what this bill would do, it's now on the floor of the House, I'm a chief co-sponsor, it's my biggest initiative, it's really the bill that I ran for office to, to work on, would say, let's stop this broken, screwed up system of funding we have right now, where the state of Illinois provides about 30% of the funding for public education. Nationwide, that average is closer to 50. And what it leads to is this balkanized school system because the current streams of funding don't take into account a kid living in concentrated poverty who needs a little bit more help, does not take into account special education in a comprehensive way or transportation needs for our rural schools downstate. Let's actually put this all into one pot. Let's make 90% of our funding subject to those factors that we just talked about. And all of a sudden, you don't have this balkanized system where a kid in Winnetka gets Wait, 26. Maybe, just tell me that, that proposal again, because just the last sentence. Sure. So, What's the, the proposal? so what happens right now is that about 45% of our funding is actually subject to the factors of, of uh, poverty, of special education, of transportation, the, the needs of an individual school district. So it's kind of a one size fits all. This would shift that to closer to 90% going into this formula, having weights for kids in concentrated poverty, weights for kids who have special so does, needs. Excuse me, but does, that mean, take, does is, that mean taking money from higher income recipients now and giving them to lower it income It means that they would, those districts would, based on their local resources, receive less state funding, potentially, okay. that they could make up for okay. with their local resources. So you're because right, Hold on, Jeff, okay. let me finish. Yeah. Because right now what happens is effectively, if I go to a school in uh, a wealthier suburb, one of these schools where potentially some of these voucher kids would potentially be going, you get about $26,000 a year to go to school. That's literally double what a kid gets in CPS, and we wonder why we see some of the outcomes well, we excuse see. Excuse me, they're not, they're not large numbers, and I, look, I'll bet you anything, I'll bet you your house if you have one, I'll bet you one for mine if I had one, that there are not large numbers, like 80% of the kids in Illinois who are at school that spend 26,000 per kid per year. There really aren't. Do you think there are? I, I'm, I don't understand. Well, you just said 26,000 per, you said, at CPS, they only spend 13000 per year. That's right. You said there are other districts where they spend 26000 That's correct. There's like a handful. No, you it's a pretty large number. And, give and me, when, no, give me the percentage. Let's get specific I here. I can't give Five, you the percentage. 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30. Just give me a number. Let's say, let's say it's 10 to 15. Well, then there's let's not enough 10. money. You cannot get enough from those 10% mm -hmm. to help these 400,000 kids across the state so of first, Illinois. I don't help. agree with that. First of all, 400,000 okay. is just in CPS. But what we're talking about here no, is fun, across the state what we're of talking Illinois, about is fun, of, Excuse well, me. Jeff. Across the state of Illinois, we have 2 million kids in school, and I'm betting 400,000 at least are in failing schools. I want to help them. I, think I want to help I think it's more you want to help them. I think it's more than I said than at that. least. I said you couldn't even cover 400,000. The with point here is about the fundamental okay. rebalance of the system, okay. Jeff. It's not just about the, it's not just about the individual peace. It's about how is the system rebalanced in a way that as we start to recover from our recession, start to see more tax dollars come in, okay. we have more dollars going into a system that actually works. We don't have that right now. What we do you can't. lose if you try it my way? And then we're going to go on to other issues because we've, this is an important issue. If you try it my way, because, you know, we've tried it your way. Mm -hmm. I, we've tried to say people give more money here. My way doesn't require any more money from anybody. It says whatever the distribution is now, that stays the same. My way is to allow black kids and Hispanic kids of low-income parents to get the hell out of their failing school. Mm -hmm. Your way says you guys can't leave. You girls can't leave. That's what you're saying to them. They cannot leave. If you're Barack Obama and Michelle Obama, mm -hmm. you can leave. You can go to the lab school. And you don't have kids now, I suppose, but if you did, you would be well enough off so your kids could leave. My kids could leave. The only kids who can't leave, the kids with low-income parents. Now, who's the guy who's representing low-income parents here? 
You or that me? That would be me. Well, then which I, think is why I don't think you're doing the job. I'm really, I got to be blunt because as I said, while I appreciate kids your opinion, are dying in Englewood. Jeff, they're dying in the in We the have area tried you your way in Milwaukee. And Milwaukee's public schools have not seen significant improvements in the voucher system that they've what used. Say, how much were we spending? How much of a voucher did we give them? I have no idea what the about number is. About five or six thousand at best. I'd give them thirteen thousand, not five or six. And two, I look at the studies as saying there are kids who are no worse off, and there are many who are better off. So we don't have time. I'm to sorry, do this. but that, that's not the no, those aren't the numbers that I've seen. Those aren't the numbers that well, were produced I, by I, the university. Someday, if them. you want to do a whole two-hour forum on of it, course. do it. But we've got to go on because we've only got 10 minutes left. Sure. We've got to cover budgets. Okay. We've got to cover minimum wages. What else did we forget? We've got to cover, I don't know. Okay, do you want to see the tax? The taxes are supposed to go down from 5% to 3.75% in January of 2015 Indeed. by law. If nothing happens, they will. Do you think they should go down or do you think they should stay the same? No, I think, it's a, I think the idea of them going down would lead to devastation. And here's why I say that. So it's a, a $4 billion question. Some would argue it's a little higher than that. Some would argue even eight. But let's say it's a $4 billion question. What we're dealing with is at wait some point. Wait a second, point, wait a second. Could you just, I, I want to keep, I want to keep it specific. We just had a fiscal budget. Sure. 20, 2015, right? Mm -hmm. It ends in June of 2015. Yeah. You guys passed it, right? We did. Okay. And as I understand it, that budget initially was supposed to go up from the prior year from roughly $34.5 billion to $36 billion. These people said we need more money than mm -hmm. last year. And as I understand it, the revenue decrease because for six months of this 20 fiscal year 2015, assuming that tax decrease occurs, mm -hmm. you're going to lose money of about $1.5 billion. And so Close roughly what happened, roughly, because we only got, then you can respond, People said, look, you know, all we have to do is restrict spending in 2015 fiscal to 2014 fiscal, and we've solved the billion and a half shortfall. Mm -hmm. And people, Pat Quinn and the Republicans and you and everybody can say, we have a balanced budget. Do you agree? Do we have a balanced budget in 2015? So we have a, we have a depending on how that goes, we have a challenge. And here's, here's, let Wait me, a second. No, 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 Jeff, let me explain okay. to you why. Let me explain to you why. So. I would just like a yes or no. Do we have a balanced budget? Here's our issue. So okay. you talked about the spending number okay. going up just based on what we were doing right. before. Yeah. Here's the issue. So everybody talks about the income tax and talks about it as, as us taking in more revenue than we ever had at any point in history. We have, for the first time over the past couple of years since that increase passed, made our full pension payment. So 26 new billion new dollars has come in, okay. and we've spent 28 on pensions. Okay. Uh, we have, over the last, let's say, 10 years, fiscal years, adjusted for inflation, we have cut K through 12 by 11 percent, higher education's down 40 percent, public safety and human services both down about 20 percent. So we cut K through 12 about 11 percent? About 10.7. Now, you want to tell me, because the budget was just passed in CPS a week or so ago, hmm? do you know what the total budget is? Everything, capital costs, variable costs, CPS. Do you know roughly what that budget is? Ballpark. About six, I think. A little less than six. six. Yeah. It's not down. It's not down by 11 percent. No way, because then you would be telling the budget is 6.4 billion last year, and it wasn't. So that budget. That's statewide. This, Jeff. Okay, but I'm just telling you, CPS statewide. is not down. So statewide, you know what? New is just fine. They don't need any help from anybody down Springfield. You know that. I know that. And everybody watching this show knows that. So this 11% cuts that occurred that didn't apparently happen in CPS? No, I think didn't it happen in Trier? C Where the hell CPS did it CPS has had deferred payments, deferred maintenance. No, balloon, but it balloon, wasn't Hold cut. on, Jeff. Ballooning pay, pension payments. Like, this is, it's not money that's making it to the classroom. And my point here is, at some point, you are no longer cutting fat, you are, no, you are cutting muscle, you are cutting bone, you are cutting the things that are required to grow. So when people say, mm. let it drop to 375, there isn't anybody who can answer to me what that $4 billion question is over the next two years. They can't answer that question.